I have the enviable task of introducing Andrew Marinus, who has been committed to the interaction among individuals, ethnic groups, and sports for a long time. He was awarded the Fred Russell Grantland Rice Sports Writing Scholarship, which is awarded uh, to entering freshmen at Vanderbilt University who are planning to make sports writing their career through the good offices of the Thoroughbred Racing Association. <laughs> He wrote a paper in an African-American history class, uh, and the rest was history, as you might say. Uh, in his senior year in 1992, he won the Alexander Award, and I thought you might like to know what that is. Uh, it uh, is an American Bar Association Council for Racial and ethnic diversity in the educational pipeline in the continuum, preschool to high school to college to law school, which sounds pretty impressive. <laughs> and what a good idea, a pipeline concept. Get them young and work them right through. Um, I thought that was interesting when I learned about it. Uh, so there was uh, a Vanderbilt uh, connection and then other uh, institutions that came in to the mix. Um, he, uh, he continued his association with Vanderbilt for five years in the athletic department as the associate director of media relations. He took up the challenge to serve as media relations manager for the first year of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. He came back to Nashville to join the staff at McNeely, Piggott, and Fox public relations firm where he remains today. His community service includes past president of the Nashville chapter of Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, which gives us the letter, uh, which gives us the acronym of RBI. For you baseball fans, you will know that that's, that's really cute. <laughs> and presently, he is a advisory board member of the Albert Pujols Family Foundation, and uh, the emphasis on family in the title means not only by family, but for families, and I quote, to help those living with Down syndrome and impoverished families in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Pujols was uh, the first, is the first baseman for the Angels. <laughs> I, I am ignorance itself when it comes to sports. Okay, he is committed to the relationship between profession and community and today is being awarded the Lillian Smith Prize for highlighting the bravery and struggle of Perry Wallace, who persevered in basketball and law courts as a shining pioneer. Thanks for that introduction, Mary. That's the most baseball that's ever been worked into an introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, as Lee said, I'm also honored and humbled uh, to be here today when I consider um, the scholarly work that uh, you know people like Lee have put in to their books and the other books that were nominated and the, the list of impressive authors that have won this award in the past. Uh, it's just incredible, I, especially when you consider uh, at least 
For me, a year ago, I wasn't a published author. This is my first book, uh, so every experience for me is brand new, and um, I appreciate, or approach with the greatest sense of appreciation. Uh, this day is certainly at the top of the list, and I'm really excited that my kids, four-year-old Eliza, Eliza, wave, <laughs> and two-year-old Charlie are sitting in the back of the room. Uh, my wife's here in the front. My in-laws, Doug and Kathy, are here. Uh, my friends, John Ma and Jack, and the Trochies are here. And uh, Perry Wallace, some members of Perry Wallace's family are here, including his sister, Annie, right here in the front row. There's also another special person in the crowd that I'll mention in a minute. Um, thank you to the judges and to all the great sponsors of this award. I deeply, deeply appreciate this. Um, at the same time, I'm personally thankful, though I completely recognize that this award is not about me. It's about the uh, strength and courage and determination of the person I was very fortunate uh, to have the chance to write about, uh, Perry Wallace. And what I consider the greatest aspect of this award is that Perry Wallace is getting the um, recognition as a civil rights figure, sports and civil rights figure of the caliber of a Jackie Robinson, which I think is totally the case. And in some cases, Perry's journey was more difficult than Jackie Robinson's when you consider the time and the place that Perry was a pioneer in the Deep South in the late 1960s. And most people have heard Jackie Robinson's story. Very few people have ever heard Perry Wallace's story. And for those of you in here who don't know anything about Perry Wallace, briefly, he was the Jackie Robinson of the Deep South. He was the first African-American basketball player, varsity basketball player in the Southeastern Conference, uh, first uh, black athlete in the SEC in any sport that played a full career. Uh, he went on to attend law school at Columbia University. He's today he's a professor of law at American University, uh, just an incredible person. And in some ways, it's, uh, it's a shame that it took 45 years after he graduated for someone to tell his story, but I feel very fortunate that I had the chance to do it. Uh, this project for me began uh, when I was 19 years old in 1989. Uh, as Mary mentioned, I came to Vanderbilt on a sports writing scholarship. I was a history major, and I happened to read a student magazine article about the first game that Perry Wallace and his one African-American teammate his freshman year, Godfrey Dillard, uh, played at Mississippi State University Road Game in Starkville. And the racism that they encountered in the first half of the game was so vicious that at halftime, Perry and Godfrey, these two young, strong athletes, held hands as they sat on the bench in the locker room to gain the strength to go back out there and play the second half of the ball game. So as someone who was interested in sports and history, that's what first grabbed my attention. I asked my professor, uh, Dr. Jones, if it was acceptable to write about sports in college. Um, I didn't know if that was cool at a school like Vanderbilt. And uh, she said, yes, of course, go for it. And so I found Perry, who was then a professor in Baltimore, and interviewed him uh, for a paper that I wrote for that class. And so I also understand this is the first time that Lillian Smith Awards have recognized a book that deals with sports. You know, I had that same question, would an awards like this, you know, accept a book about sports? And so I'm really uh, <laughs> proud that you did. And I think that, you know, sports plays, for better or worse, such an a important role in American culture and has been a part of, uh, you know, um, certainly the segregation in, in the South, the story of the South, the sports has always been a, a, in a pivotal uh, role in perpetuating that, and people like Perry and Godfrey helped bring that down. So, you know, thank you for taking a chance on a, on a book about sports. Um, that said, I set out to write a book that was about a lot more than just sports. And Perry Wallace himself used sports as a means to an end. In his case, he saw a basketball scholarship as his ticket out of the South, his way out of uh, segregated Nashville. And he had his sights set on receiving a scholarship somewhere uh, in the Big Ten, uh, northern schools like Michigan or Iowa, Wisconsin, uh, or the Pac-10. He was recruited by John Wooden out at UCLA. And actually, the reason that he ended up staying home, he grew up in Nashville, he stayed home to go attend Vanderbilt, was not necessarily to make history as a pioneer, but because he said he wasn't going to trade one plantation for another. He wasn't going to leave. Uh, Nashville only to end up being exploited for his athletic ability at a school that uh, told him, don't worry about going to class or we'll find the easiest classes for you. You're just here to play basketball. 
And so he made the decision uh, after having a recruiting trip to Vanderbilt where he was impressed by the engineering school and that the players actually were going to class that despite the fact that he would be a pioneer, he was going to come do it so he could get a good education and play big time college basketball. Um, for me, I use basketball as a means to an end as well as a way to enter the South and to um, tell a story of Nashville, which has so many different civil rights angles you could go with, um, through the vehicle of this smart young teenager who was making history as a pioneer on the basketball court, but that was traveling to all these places in the Deep South, like Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where the governor had just been standing in front of the schoolhouse door, you know, or Ole Miss, just a few years after James Meredith was there. Uh, but the thing was, uh, Perry didn't make this decision alone. There was another uh, smart, young African-American basketball player who made the decision to come to Vanderbilt. He came from Detroit, Michigan, and he's in the crowd today. He lives uh, part-time in the city of Atlanta, and I'm so happy that Godfrey Dillard is here today. Godfrey, do you just please stand up? Thank you for being here, Godfrey. And Godfrey's story uh, is told in the book, and it takes a different path than Perry's. Uh, but Godfrey's been a huge success in life. He's argued before the US Supreme Court. He's been a diplomat in Africa, and he just recently ran for Secretary of State in the state of Michigan. So again, thank you for being here, Godfrey. Um, in receiving this award, is the first time I ever read a book by Lillian Smith. I read Killers of the Dream just a couple weeks ago. And she starts the book by saying, even the children knew the South was in trouble. No one had to tell them. And as a father of two young kids, I was really struck uh, just by this notion of introducing children in the way that uh, the toxic environment of segregation affected um, black and white kids at the time. And uh, in the book, I talk a lot about Perry's uh, life, his, his childhood in Nashville and the, the dangers that he faced uh, one time standing on a street corner to catch a bus, a carload of white teenagers pulled around the corner with pointing a gun out the window at his face. He's just trying to go home from school. Uh, he had to walk through a white neighborhood to get to the black elementary school and kids would pick fights with him almost every day on his way to elementary school. Uh, think about him dealing with sort of the daily realities of living in a, a Jim Crow town where he sat down in the first seat he saw on the bus, not knowing he couldn't sit there, and his mom had to whisk him away to the back of the bus. Um, his family lived right across the street from North High School, which was a white school, and so Perry would just have to stand against the fence looking at these kids having fun playing on the playground at a school that he wasn't allowed to go to. Uh, but also about the determination that he still showed in the face of this society that was sort of designed to limit him. He didn't let it limit him. So. Uh, even in kindergarten, he was showing the signs of uh, character that would see him through the most difficult days as a pioneer in the SEC. His sister, Jessie, told me that she showed up to pick him up from school, and the teacher had left the room, and all the other kids in the classroom were going berserk, running around, bouncing off the walls, and there was one kid still sitting at his desk doing his work, doing the right thing, and that was her brother, Perry Wallace. Um, Perry's mom, uh, would bring home magazines from her job as a cleaning lady at office buildings in downtown Nashville and show all the Wallace children pictures in these magazines and say, there's a bigger world out there. You know, this is what you can aspire to. Um, and Perry considered the slam dunk his freedom song. He said this town that he lived in uh, was dark in many ways and again designed to limit him, but on the basketball court, he found his freedom soaring through the air. And so even at this playground across the street where he wasn't supposed to be on weekends, he would go practice his basketball. And that's where he learned how to slam dunk. Uh, and it, all of this led him straight into the heart of the uh, civil rights movement. <clears throat> so Perry started kindergarten in 1954, obviously year of Brown versus Board. Uh, he was a young kid when Emmett Till was murdered and was around the same age, was profoundly influenced by that. In 1960, the lunch counter sit-ins were taking place in Nashville. And Perry would sneak from his parents' house in North Nashville downtown to watch the sit-ins and watch these students with his own eyes. He entered high school, Pearl High School in Nashville, the week after Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. He was in high school for the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. And he, what he told me was that he could feel the country was changing and there would be opportunities there for him and members of his uh, class 
class of 66 that hadn't been there for their older siblings or certainly for their parents and he needed to be prepared to take advantage of these opportunities and he was. So he accepts this dangerous assignment to integrate the SEC and come to school at Vanderbilt. And one uh, saying that Perry has today, he'll say that all of us can treat each other in any of three ways. We can treat each other well, we can treat each other poorly, or we can not be treated at all. And Perry was treated well by some people. He was treated poorly by even more people. <clears throat> but what he would say is that the most difficult aspect of his experience was this feeling of not being treated at all, of feeling invisible on this campus, being denied his humanity. And there's a passage in um, Killers of the Dream where uh, Lillian Smith talks about she's talking to a, a white girl in a, a theater setting and the girl says to her, I understand that segregation is wrong and I don't want to hate people, but I don't want people to hate me either. And I'm afraid to speak out because I really don't want to make waves um, and have my friends disagree with me and just being a little bit afraid to challenge the status quo. In that sense of not speaking up is something that uh, happened quite often in Perry's experience. I opened the book with a scene where his old teammate Bob Warren, who had played basketball at Vanderbilt with in the late 60s, uh, Bob Warren didn't understand at all what his teammate was going through back then, but he played professional basketball for about 10 years where most of his teammates were African American. And he, he told me in an interview that that's when it finally began to dawn on him, oh my gosh, what hell must my teammate Perry have been going through as we made these road trips uh, through the Deep South. And so one day Bob Warren happened to be on a business trip in Washington DC where Perry Wallace teaches and he unannounced took a cab over to American University Law School, the elevator up to the fourth floor and walked into Perry Wallace's office and shook his hand and said, Perry, please forgive me, there's so much more I could have done. And that scene is three-fourths of a page, it's the first chapter of the book, and since the book has come out, Perry and I have both received countless emails and calls from people who are contemporaries of Perry's basically saying the same thing, that, oh my gosh, there's so much more they could have done. And when I go speak at schools about this book, it's my message to the to the kids is don't end up as one of those people that takes 40 years to realize there's people around you that need uh, you to reach out a, a hand, you know, um, do that now while you have the opportunity. And the final thing I wanted to say, uh, also in the book, Lillian Smith says that uh, words can ar arouse a conscience. And it seems like an obvious thing to say that words can arouse a conscience. But the point she's making is that too often people don't express those words. And the context that she was talking about was newspapers, even liberal papers at the time in the South, being afraid to speak out against civil rights because they were concerned that it would only make things worse. <coughs> and in that regard, the most courageous thing that Perry Wallace ever did wasn't going out on the basketball court at Mississippi State. It was giving an interview to the Tennessean in Nashville the day after his last game, where he said that he felt a moral obligation to tell the truth about what his experience had been like, even though he knew people weren't going to be ready to hear this truth, that he would be run out of town if he gave this interview. Here he had been a high school valedictorian, engineering major at Vandy, all SEC basketball player, three-time state champion, high school basketball player, setting himself up for a bright future in his hometown. But if he knew, if he gave this interview, he would never have a career in this town. But he gave the interview anyway. And unfortunately, he was, he was correct. The day after the story ran, people weren't ready to hear it. I talked to the editors of the paper. They told me that the phones rang off the hook that day with Vanderbilt fans calling to cancel their subscriptions to the paper, calling Perry Wallace ungrateful and wishing him good riddance out of town. But uh, my greatest satisfaction with this book is that his words have aroused a conscience. It just it took 45 years, unfortunately. Um, and Perry will say today that reconciliation without the truth is just acting, uh, which I think is a pretty interesting phrase. And um, my, uh, my hope is that this book represents the truth. And if I did nothing else but just listen to what Godfrey and Perry had to tell me, uh, it, it would certainly be the truth. So Perry came back to Nashville the first week of December when the book came out, and he was concerned what sort of reception he would get. We haven't, he hadn't been back uh, in any significant way since 1970, 
when he was basically run out of town. He said, we're entering a hot environment. What's this going to be like? But it turned out to be great. They were uh, in a room that sort of like this. It seats 250 people. 400 people showed up. We had 150 people across the hall. After we both spoke, they lined up for two hours uh, to see Perry and to shake his hand and have him sign their books. And I was sitting next to Perry. And some people were asking for my signature. Everyone was asking for Perry's signature. And so I was observing what was happening. And person after person would come up. And they had bloodshot eyes, or they were still crying. And they were just like Bob Warren. They were coming up one after another to express this regret. They hadn't done more to understand what Perry was going through at the time. They were finally beginning to understand it after hearing his story and, and reading the book. Um, since then, the city government in Nashville has uh, honored Perry at a Metro Council meeting. The state government has issued a proclamation in his honor. Congressman uh, Cohen from Memphis has read something into the congressional record. When Perry came back to town, the police chief and the mayor were the first two people to greet him, which I thought was very symbolic uh, in a positive way. And his story sort of becoming known and arousing a conscience, I feel like, is culminated today with it being included in this great litany of, of books that have received the Lillian Smith Book Award. So uh, thank you so much for honoring uh, Perry Godfrey, strong inside. I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you.